In this presentation, we will try to answer the question, is a gender perspective compatible with women's identity? Our presentation will be in three parts. First, we will expose the development of gender feminism. Then we will show its influence on international institutions. And to conclude, we will explore the ways for women to regain their femininity. To understand the genesis of gender feminism, let's first look at the foundations of modern philosophy. The French philosopher René Descartes is the father of modern philosophy. He overthrew the classical conception of the human person given by Aristotle in the 4th century before Christ and St. Thomas d'Aquinas in the 13th century AD. The cornerstone of this thought is the cogito, and he drew the consequences of it. Separation of body and mind, primacy of the spirit of the, the body, and the goal of humankind is to render ourselves lords and possessors of nature. As a result, the harmony of the human being as spirit and body is broken. Now on, the body has a utilitarian vocation and it no longer participates in the process of human knowledge with its five senses. Cartesian man is a dissociated being with his dualism which puts body and mind in opposition. Before Descartes, we were our body. Since Descartes, we have a body. In a way, we became lords and possessor of nature through a fantastic increase in knowledge and techniques in all fields, including medicine and particularly in biology and reproductive technologies. In this modern way of thinking, the body is an object to be mastered, and especially the women's body. Nowadays, in medicine, the female body is considered as a machine that must be domesticated, optimized with techniques, which can be exploited, even merchandised. Think about contraception, abortion, assisted reproduction, IVF, surrogacy, etc. All feminist movements of the 20th century made theirs these techniques of enslaving their own body with the slogan, my body belongs to me. A remark, only the topic of surrogacy and of surrogate mothers divides radical feminist movements. Now let's have a look at how feminism embraced the gender perspective. Three women as philosophers, writers, feminists, strongly inspired the 20th century gender feminism. Simone de Beauvoir, Monique Wittig and Judith Butler. Simone de Beauvoir, companion of the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, is part of the existentialist movement. She turned the existentialist mantra that existence precedes essence into a feminist one. One is not born a woman, but becomes one. We find it in The Second Sex that she published in 1949. She was a talented writer, an atheist, politically engaged alongside the communists, and she campaigned for abortion and euthanasia. De Beauvoir is the first to have articulated the sex-gender distinction, that is, the distinction between biological sex and the social construction of gender with its attendant stereotypes. De Beauvoir advocates to, for the liberation and empowerment of women in a historical, scientific and soci sociological approach she tries to demonstrate to what extent men 
Aryan Age women. Marriage is for her a disgusting institution. And motherhood itself is seen as an alienation, an almost animal regression. She claims total emancipation. To illustrate or point some quotes from Second Sex. It is through work that the woman has largely crossed the distance which separated her from the male. It is work alone that can guarantee concrete freedom. First raped, the female is then alienated, inhabited by another who feeds on a substance. The female during gestation is boss herself and other than herself. De Beauvoir strongly influenced the feminist movement in its egalitarian component. A thinking foreshadows the 20th century feminist movements that advocate for the empowerment of women and fight against sexist stereotypes. We will give two examples, one with the CEDO Convention and the other one with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the CEDO Convention, already called in the 1980s for the elimination of stereotypes roles of men and women, without defining the term stereotypes. In January 2000, the CEDO Committee criticized Belarus for having reintroduced a Mother's Day because, according to CEDO, this day and celebration represents a negative stereotype for women. The empowerment of women and gender equality in the UN Sustainable Development Goal No. 5 echoes the thought of de Beauvoir, including the universal access to sexual and reproductive health, which means universal access to contraception, abortion and reproductive techniques. Not a word on maternity protection. It can't be an objective for the UN experts because it would reinforce the alienation of women. Let's move forward. The dream of continuous progress has been shaken by two world wars, by the Holocaust, by the fear of nuclear war, by the degradation of the environment. The optimism of modernity gave way to disenchantment, to rejection. It is the birth of postmodernity, whose supreme value is freedom to choose. The 1968 revolution in France took it up with the slogan It is forbidden to forbid. The French universities led the intellectual foundations of postmodernism. Their thinkers built what is called the French theory, where the notion of deconstruction holds a central place. Postmodernism is an attitude of skepticism, irony, and rejection of norms. In the 1980s, the American universities were fascinated by the French theory. They studied it, and that contributed to the emergence of gender studies and later on of the queer studies. The French theory was also a source of inspiration for the gender feminist movements of the 20th century. Monique Wittig and Judith Butler are prominent representatives of it. Monique Wittig is a French feminist novelist whose work greatly influenced the feminist movement and the gender theory. She was a founding member of the Red Dykes, the first lesbian group in Paris. Wittig also led the French women's liberation movement. She called herself a radical lesbian 
a sentence that denotes both sexual preference and political choice. In her novels, she only portrayed women. In 1976, she left Paris for the United States, where her theories were taught in several American universities. She died in Tucson in 2003. In 1992, in the US, she published The Straight Mind and other essays. It is a manifesto of a political current that can be called the LGBT gender feminism. This current is against any form of feminism that does not challenge heterosexual dogma, what Wittig calls the straight mind. She writes in the straight mind, we must destroy politically, philosophically and symbolically the categories of male and female. Heterosexuality is a political reign we live under founded on female slavery. For Wittig, heterosexuality is neither natural nor given. Heterosexuality is a political regime. To free oneself from it, it is important to establish the class struggle in order to eliminate the categories of men and women, which are normative and alienating. For Wittig, the category woman was created by heterosexual norms and must be abolished. She will use literature as a mean of political action. Her utopia is the abolition of the sexes, which goes hand in hand with the abolition of the grammatical genders, he and she, male and female. In a way, she is at the origin of neutral language and inclusive writing. And even that, what we see appearing with the implementation of inclusive writing in our administration's culture. For example, in 2008, the AU Council issued a guide to the use of gender-neutral language in the European Parliament. For instance, in English, the combined forms he and she, him and her, must be avoided. Judith Butler is an American Jewish philosopher born in 1956 in Cleveland and professor at Berkeley University since 1993. But she teaches also in different uni European universities, as you can see. Butler became the world star of queer studies with her essay, Gender Trouble, Feminism and the Subversion of Identity, published in 1990. The book was a great editorial success. It was published in France only in 2005. She wrote other books about gender identity like Bodies That Matter on the Discursive Limits of Sex, three years later, and Undoing Gender in Top. 2004. Butler is working on the concept of identity, influenced by the French postmodernist philosophers Foucault and Derrida. She develops the theory of gender performance. For her, gender is a social performance learned, repeated, and performed. The repetition of a female or male performance produces the fiction of a natural female or male gender. For Butler, gender identity should be a voluntary and daily choice. And that is the queer thinking. To rethink identities outside any normative framework by dissociating biological sex from social constructed gender and by adding sexual desire to it. So it means that one day you can be a woman, biologically female, but declare to have a male gender and feel a gay or straight, be or even asexual desire. 
and the day after decide to change your gender and feel another sexual desire. Butler is famous for obscure, even incomprehensible style. Hereafter, a beautiful example. As a strategy to denaturalize and resignify bodily categories, I describe and propose a set of parodic practices based in a performative theory of gender acts that disrupt the categories of body, sex, gender, and sexuality, and which initiate a subversive process of resignification and proliferation of meaning beyond the strictly binary framework. Butler had a major influence on our time. How not to think of the 17 nuances of gender proposed by Facebook UK? That is a trivialization of polymorphic sexual behaviors. How not to think of the fight against stereotypes as a pretext to introduce gender trouble into education? For instance, teachers in French primary schools are invited to read books that reverse stereotypes. Dad wears a dress. Maddie puts on lipstick. How not to think of Comprehensive Sex Education, CSE, promoted by the UN and UNESCO. CSE sexualizes children from the very young age This extract of guidance, published by UNESCO, promotes dissociation between biological sex and gender identity. We saw how the gender feminism appeared through major feminist philosophers. And we have illustrated their influence on the culture and educational policies in our countries or institutions. This influence, under the pressure of feminist lobbies, both in their egalitarian and LGBT tendencies, has affected the policies of all our international bodies. A brief reminder, until 2011, in international official texts, gender meant male or female and was based on biological sex, on the binary identity, man, woman. But under the influence of gender feminism, the term gender has become very ambiguous as it appeared to mean less about identity and more and more about sexual behavior based on desire. Under the guise of equality between men and women, gender identity in UN documents took into account multiple gender denominations for example, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, pansexual, genderqueer, etc. And it was in the name of the fight against the violence against women and discrimination against minorities. Identity has become fluctuating and polymorphic. In 2011, The Istanbul Convention was the first legally binding international convention which provides a definition of the word gender, removing all reference to the biological dimension. This definition of gender echoes the thinking of the gender feminism we have just exposed. We have seen that gender feminism, both egalitarian and LGBT, are based on the refusal of the distinction of the sexes and on the conviction that the heterosexual norm is not legitimate and a source of violence. We can't deny the difficulties, the violence, the abuse of power between the two sexes. They do exist, but does gender ideology provide the right answer to these problems? Aren't all these problems relationship difficulties between people? Gender feminism is a mirage. It does not keep its promises. It brings division, 
separates men and women, rejects motherhood and the complementary identity of women and men. Gender feminism deconstructs without building. It breaks the relationship between men and women, between children and their parents. By its fluctuating side, it prevents having a stable and lasting relationship. Above all, gender ideology is sterile, because fertility comes from the difference between men and women. In fact, the question is, what is my body telling me about myself? How can I reconcile my body and my mind? The body is intelligent. It has a message. It is a vector of our mind, and without it, we can't do anything. We must listen to it and respect it. As such, maternity is not alienation. It's a gift, a privilege women have, a privilege that must be protected. To regain femininity, we need men to be masculine. That's obvious. The relationship between men and women is today's challenge. Learning to respect and understand the other sex is the key. We need to rediscover that man and woman are equal in dignity, but mutually complementary by respecting their differences. Hence the importance of education about alterity. By learning to know the other sex, how to respect it, to understand the meaning of differences, their beauty in the service of life. Thank you.